<laughs> but I don't know about you, I'm loving this series. And I think any series that is all about Jesus is going to be a win. How many other people in the room, you want to hear about Jesus, you want to know more about him. I've loved it. It's been phenomenal. And Joel's, Joel's message last week, Eyes on Jesus, was incredible. And can I encourage you, if you missed it for any reason, to actually jump on YouTube and go and watch it back. What you don't know is that Joel preached that message with a raging ear infection. So there was more than the usual price paid to get that message out. So please, if you missed it, jump on, grab that message. We're on a journey together and don't want anybody missing out all right, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into it right away. No halfway through my message, no triggering people that will be here all day, although it is a bit later than usual. Father, we give you glory. Jesus, there's a reason this series has your name on it. We love you. We honor you. We worship you. We're in reverence to you. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you for your goodness that we've sung about this morning. We thank you for your tangible presence that is here in our midst right now. And Father, I give you my lips. I give you every word that comes out of my mouth. And Lord, I ask that you speak what you want your people to hear, that you meet hearts and minds right where they're at, that faith would rise in this meeting today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can say stuff. You can respond. It's okay. It's a bit quiet in here this morning. So today I want to focus on something that Jesus talked about a lot. I thought we've talked about encounters with Jesus. We've talked about his relationship to the Father. We've talked about all kinds of things about Jesus. But today I actually want to focus on something that Jesus taught. It, it has been called the essence of his teaching because he spoke on this subject more than 90 times in the gospel. I want to read to you from Matthew 4, verse 17, where it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Or in the message version, it says, Change your life. God's kingdom is here. Today, I want to talk about this concept, the kingdom of heaven. When I hear the word kingdom, my mind goes to amazing big castles with moats, princes, princesses, Battles over high walls, knights on horses because they're the victorious ones. That's kind of what comes to mind when I think of kingdom. This notion of kingdom can be a really hard one to get around. I mean, what's a kingdom today? And then when you hear the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, I don't know about you, but I'm straight away seeing massive angels with these big ornate wings and trumpets Worship fills the atmosphere, golden crusts, everything. And there's just this white light. This is what I'm thinking of when I think of the kingdom of heaven. I don't know where your mind goes, but kingdom doesn't really have a relevance today for us, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> when Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven was here, the Jewish people would have had ideas about how this could look too. They were doing it tough. They lived oppressed by the Romans who were powerful and mighty. There was political turmoil and there was nothing that these people of Israel could do to escape the oppression they faced. They just had this thing that their hope rested on, which was a Messiah who had been prophesied in the Old Testament. He'd been prophesied that a Messiah would come. He would... And, he would bring God's kingdom. He would bring peace for the people of God. And it's likely that they believe that this Messiah would come, not riding in on the donkey, but riding in on a really muscular steed with a sword and a crown and an army, ready to overthrow those who would oppose God's people. I imagine this is kind of what they expected when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come. So when Jesus said, repeat, for the kingdom of God has come, I can kind of imagine the Jewish people going, where? Now? For real? I can't see a king on a throne. I can't see a kingdom. In fact, nothing has changed. They'd seen the miracles, but they were still oppressed and there had been no physical change to their current situation. They might have wondered, but... but Jesus, where's the overthrow? 
Where's the, where's, the th- where's the show of force? They expected their Messiah would come as an earthly king would come. This was not to be. The biblical word for kingdom doesn't actually speak about a place. It isn't a physical reality. It speaks of the reign of a king over his people. The reign of a king. That's what kingdom in the Bible means. And in Luke 17, verse 20 to 21, it says this, One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, When will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, The kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, Here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Jesus made it pretty clear that God's kingdom wasn't going to be a place or a physical, tangible reality at all. When I read his words in this last passage, I feel like he was also saying, uh, duh, I'm standing right in front of you. Can you not see it? The kingdom is here. What they didn't get is that God's reign in, in, is actually in our lives. And God's reign, God's kingdom must be accepted based on faith. Based on faith. I want to do a little jump here. So come with me. I want to look at John the Baptist for a minute. And I want to first just give you some facts about John because they're relevant here. You're with me? We're talking about John now, but it's applicable to the kingdom of God. The first thing I want to point out is that John's first encounter with Jesus was before he was even born. And it was an incredible encounter. Luke 1 verse 41. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, we know as John, leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This was not just a regular coffee catch up between pregnant mamas. This was an encounter. There was something about this baby in Mary's womb. They recognized it, right? His first encounter was before he was even born. Second, John spent his time preparing the way for the Lord. He literally spent his days proclaiming that the Messiah was coming. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. That's how he spent his days. The third thing is that John actually had the privilege of being the one to baptize Jesus. Not only did he get to baptize him, but as he came, he came up out of the water And the Holy Spirit came on him like a dove. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Safe to say, John knew who Jesus was. He had a revelation that this Jesus was not just another prophet. He was not just some guy who did wonderful things. This guy, this Jesus was the Messiah. John knew that. He had that conviction. And in light of this, I want to look at something John the Baptist said. Matthew 11, verse 2 to 3. John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. When he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask, are you the one we've been waiting, uh, we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? Remember, John knew who Jesus was, and it's quite puzzling to me that it was John hearing about the wonderful ministry of Jesus that actually compelled him to go, hey, Jesus, are are you really the one? Are you really the Messiah? I mean, doesn't it cause confusion in you a little bit too? Like, why was he asking this question? What Jesus was doing was awesome, but he was asking the question. It was a loaded question. See, John had spent his time preaching hard-hitting messages. It wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been comfortable to sit under his teaching if you were kind of lukewarm or like half-hearted about your response to repentance and faith. Here's one example of John's use of strong language in Matthew three ten. It says, "What counts is your life. Is it green and flourishing?" Or bearing fruit. Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. It goes on the fire. He also said that Messiah was coming to gather the wheat into the barn and burn up the chaff or the useless straw. 
with unquenchable fire. This is not mamby-pamby, soft, there, there, Jesus loves. This is not that kind of teaching. He was hard hitting. He was hard in regards to repentance and changing your life in preparation for the Messiah who would come. And so he hears Jesus doing all these miracles, preaching to the people. And he's like, but where's the fire? Where's the, where's the like, Rah! I don't know how else to say it this morning. Where's all that? Where's the rest, Jesus? Why aren't you doing all those things that I talked about? And hey, actually, why aren't you, why aren't you doing something to overthrow this king that put me in this prison? Why aren't you getting me out of here? John had a number of things that could have led to him asking this question. And after a year, I think he's been in prison for a whole year. He's lived shut up and shut out. Just in those four walls, simmering. And he comes to this place of doubt and confusion that led him to ask the question. And I believe John came to a place of realizing that actually he was disappointed because Jesus wasn't doing what he expected him to do. You know, I think that John's question would well have been asked by the Jews too. We don't see it in the Bible, but we see evidence that they felt this way. See, the reality of Jesus' ministry and the coming of the kingdom of God didn't meet their expectations either. Their expectation was that he'd come in, that they'd see it, that they'd recognize it, that he'd overthrow those who oppressed them, and he would rule in a way that looked like ruling, in a way that was tangible. I'm going to be bold enough to say this as Christians, with the reign of God inside of us, with God as our king, but an address here on earth. I wonder too if sometimes you find yourself perplexed, down, maybe confused because your reality doesn't make sense and you wonder where God fits and all that's going down right now for you. Maybe your life doesn't always look the way you think it should with Jesus as your king. Maybe you've been dealt a hard lot and you're just trying to get your head around, well, God, why me? How could this happen if, if you're the king? I believe that like John, most of us know who Jesus is. Most of us have said yes to him as our Lord, as our Savior. We would say that he is the king of our lives. That's not up for question. But there are still times when life just smacks us in the face and the outside stuff speaks louder and we lose sight of his goodness. We lose sight of his faithfulness. And we find ourselves asking, Lord, where are you in all this? How, how could this happen when you love me and I follow you and you're my king and you've got good things for my life? This is not what I expected following Jesus would look like. You know, I have times when I feel like this too. You know, why? Why did this happen to me? And I wish God would just change things in an instant because he can, right? Why don't you, God? Why don't you just click your fingers? Why don't you just, you know, just a word and everything turns around? Why, God? Just this week, something happened in our family that sent me reeling. It felt like anything but favor and it had me perplexed on a whole nother level. I was gutted, I was saddened, and I was disappointed by my reality. Why was this happening to me? We'll get back to that. So let's go back to John. He asked a hard-hitting and very loaded question of Jesus based on what he didn't see Jesus doing because of what he thought he should do. It didn't meet his expectations. And I love what we see in Jesus' response. He could have gone, shh, shh, shh. who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, John? But here's what he did. Matthew 11, verses four to six, and Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. 
the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This response was beautiful by Jesus. He could choose his response. He could have slapped John around, but he didn't. In what Jesus said, there was something that John would have noticed, but we can easily miss. And I want to point that out. Jesus wasn't just saying that he could heal sick people and he could raise the dead and he could preach. That's what we read on the surface. But actually, Jesus was referencing Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in how he was ministering and indicating that, hey, he had ticked these boxes, the rest would come, John. I got this. I am the one. I am the one you've been looking for. I'm he. I got this. He finishes his answer in a peculiar way, verse 6. And it kind of reads like a beatitude, actually. He says this, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus here is gently saying that he is not going to immediately meet John's expectations, but to keep hold of faith. The sentiment would be helpful to the Jewish people of the time and actually to our lives too. Do you know that so many people back then and all the way through to now and probably all the way through humanity have actually rejected God because he didn't meet their expectations. Essentially, they've become offended by him. So I want to tie this all up. Jesus coming in the reign of God with him marked a new day for God's people, for all of humanity, not just the Jews, that played out later, for all of humanity, that includes you and that includes me. A new day had begun. The reign of God is not a physical, tangible reality. The reign of God is God's rule in us. It's God's rule in us. And just as in John's situation, When things don't always go our way, we can stay confident in faith knowing that God has all the things in hand and we can trust Him. See, just because we don't understand doesn't mean God doesn't know what He's doing. He has the better way. He has the better timing. He knows the beginning from the end. We need to acknowledge that He is God and we are not and we can trust Him. He has good plans for us. Blessed are we when we are not offended by Him. So here's my encouragement today is instead of allowing life, because life happens to me, I'm sure it happens to you, instead of allowing life and all of the things to grab at your attention, which over time is going to leave you feeling a bit doubtful, feeling a bit confused, maybe asking some questions of God. Let's come with our needs, with our confusion, with our concerns, with all the stuff and bring it to our King in prayer. Earlier I said that something happened in our family this week that had me reeling. It really did. It's, it sent me into a spin. I was like, God, this is not cool. And you know, the day finished, went to bed, woke up in the morning, had a completely unrelated appointment, I'm driving in the car, and I love car prayer. Who else loves car prayer? Car prayer is amazing. You can be like, yeah, God, oh, God, oh, God, all the tears, all the mess, all the snot. You can pray so, so real in the car. I just love it. No audience except for him. So I had a car pray, and I had, I've been hugely affected by what had happened the previous day. And I knew that simmering in that was not going to be a good thing. It would ruin this day, the next day. It would would rob what could happen moving forward. And so I did something. I led myself. I knew I had to pray, but I started with gratitude. I started with that posture that Joel was speaking about last week of reverence. I just thought of all the things I could thank God for. They weren't at the forefront of my mind. The situation was what was there. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are faithful. And I just prayed as much as I could until I ran out of things to be grateful for. And then I threw my hand, because the other hand was on the wheel, 
up in the air, and I said, God, this is too much for me. You know this situation. You care about me. You care about this family. I give this to you. And I prayed his authority over what was happening. I then went back to reverence. I just thanked him again. And it's crazy. I finished praying, and immediately something had shifted. My physical situation is actually still the same. I still have things to work through from what happened. However, everything shifted when I prayed. My peace came. I mean, that's Philippians 4, 6, and 7, right? The bridge to peace. Pray. Peace came. My confidence came back that this whole situation was not the boss. The authority of they were not the boss. God is the boss. He is the king of our lives. My confidence came back. God is in control, and he will work this for the good in spite of what I see right now. No longer was I reeling and I was able to get on with the day. Small example, right? But if I didn't pray, I'd still be sitting in that. I'd still be wallowing in that. I would still be overcome by the situation which has not gone away yet. Prayer is powerful. And we've talked about it before. Prayer is the currency of heaven. Prayer is the currency of heaven. As citizens of God's kingdom, we must be prayers. Not just about the things that we deem big enough for God or like righteous enough that he'll tolerate our words. No, we must be prayers about everything. All the stuff. Prayer without ceasing means a constant conversation with God. It changes everything. You know what I love that prayer does? is it puts us back under God's authority. That it doesn't all start and stop with me. I am under the reign of God. I have a king who bats for me, who has the bigger picture, who brings about the better plan. It puts us under him and puts him back on the throne. Because you know, often we need to do that. Our humanity rises up and we're like, got this, I can do this. So I've got two things that I want to encourage you to do. I've got homework for you, and I'm excited about it because I'm going to do it too, and I think it's going to actually be awesome in our lives. First thing I want to encourage you to do, if you're in the room or if you're tuning in online, is I want us to have a kingdom-minded approach to every day. And we should do this anyway. It's not just tied to a series or a message. The first thing I want to ask you to do is to regularly and often pray the Lord's Prayer. This was how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. What are we? Disciples of Jesus. This is how we should pray. I want to just quickly run through it. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our posture is reverence. We're acknowledging that God is king and we are not. We're declaring him to be holy above all. All else, this shifts something inside of us when we pray this into the atmosphere. It shifts our posture from eyes on all the things to eyes on Jesus. We find our reverence as we declare him to be the king, as we praise him, as we worship him. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By praying the kingdom and the will of God, Second to giving honor, we're actually saying that's the priority. This is the priority. And you know, as we speak that out, I'm all about speaking it out out loud so we hear it. As we speak that out, our priorities move in line with the priorities of God. His kingdom, His will should be first. Should be first. So speak it out. See your posture shift. Give us this day our daily bread. This is when you go like, God, (laughs) I just give you that stuff. I ask you for help. However it looks, talk to him about all the stuff, your needs, your worries, your wants, all the stuff. And you know what? I like to go, I give that to you. And the reason I do that is because I'm like, whatever the outcome, you're good and I trust you. Give him your needs. Talk to him about the stuff. Make your requests known to him. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Man, this one's a toughie. (laughs) My only thing that I'd say here is we are 
We are citizens of the kingdom of God. This is a kingdom principle. It's not a human one. It's not something we want to do. I don't want to forgive some people. (laughs) I just don't. But I know that it's biblical. And you know what? It actually says just after this that that God's forgiveness for me is actually tied to my ability to forgive others. So here's a helpful thing I'd love to give you. If you don't feel like forgiving somebody, whenever you think of them, start to pray for them. Not to pray that God had changed them and He fixed them and He punished them. No, that's not right. Pray blessing on them. Ask God to change your heart in regards to them. Declare that you forgive them for what they have done. Do it often. Do it all the time if you have to. You'll find over time you stop having to do it so much and the feelings actually come. You're going to start to actually forgive that person. just might be a process, but it's biblical to forgive. Forgive, forgive. Declare it as you pray. And there's a part here that we all know, it's not in all the Bible versions, but I want to include it today because I love it. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, it's posturing, reverence. He is all powerful. He is glorious. He is forever and ever. He is constant. He's not going anywhere. He's not shifting sand. He's solid. We can depend on Him. It's an incredible prayer. All right. Okay. I'm calling us to live kingdom minded. The first one is pray the Lord's prayer. Do it often. Personalize it to yourself. The second thing I want to ask you to do this week is to read the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. Took me about five minutes to read it yesterday morning. It's not a long read. Three chapters, it sounds like a lot. It's not. Read it. You know what happens in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7? Is There's like a concentrated amount of teaching by Jesus on how to live as residents of God's kingdom, as citizens of the kingdom of God. Want to know how to live? Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. If you get hungry after that, there's plenty more, but that's your start point. I can see a series coming out of this actually. How to live, kingdom living, how to flourish. It's all there. So two things, pray the Lord's Prayer, read the Sermon on the Mount. Do it by yourself, do it as a couple, do it with your hope group, dive into it. Don't just read it and go, tick, I'm telling Pastor Sarah that I read it. No, I don't wanna hear it. I wanna hear what did God say to you as you read it? Because you gotta deep dive, you gotta apply it to your life. All right, why don't you stand to your feet? You know, I love that the Spirit of God is in this room. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We say, have your way. Have your way in this place. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. You get the priority here in our midst. Father, I know that you wanna meet with people right now. And I invite you, Lord, you work on the hearts. You work on the spirits of your people right now. In Jesus' name. I'm gonna do two things. The first thing I wanna do is invite people to say yes to Jesus. I'm gonna do that in just a moment. The second thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna open up the altar because I believe there are people here today who as I've been speaking, God's been stirring at your heart. And I'm not gonna say you can only come up if it's about this or that. I'm gonna say if God has stirred upon in your, in your heart today and you want other believers safe, We've vetted them to come and pray with you. There's an altar that's open right here. We're gonna do that in just a moment. But first I wanna make an invite. So all eyes closed, nobody looking around. I wanna give an invitation. If you've never said yes to Jesus, and you're actually not part yet of the kingdom I've been speaking about. So actually right now it all is on you. But do you know, God sent Jesus into the world because He saw you all all that long time ago. And He said, I love you. And see, there was this big blockage between you and Him and that was every wrong thing that you've ever, ever done. So there needed to be a sacrifice for that wrongdoing. Do you know what He did? He sent His Son for you. He sent His perfect, blameless Son 
to come and to die on the cross and take your place so that you could have access to God. But it's not as simple as knowing you can have access. There's actually something you've got to do. You need to say, yes, I invite Jesus in as my Lord and Saviour, as my King. So if you would like today to invite Jesus in for the first time, I want you really quickly to pop up your hand. I'll be looking for you and I'm just gonna pray with you in just a moment. So if you wanna say yes to Jesus, please pop your hand up. If that's you today, if your heart's racing and you feel like you're gonna do something right now, shoot your hand up. Just a moment more. You're worth waiting for, just one moment more. All right, I'm gonna assume people in the room are saved. Actually, there's one other thing I wanna do. If you actually have received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, and yet if I asked you, are you walking with Him? Is He actually still the Lord of your life? If you can't honestly say to that yes, then I wanna invite you today to recommit your life to Him. We are in need of a King. We are in need of a Lord and a Saviour. And so if that's you, would you pop your hand up right now? Really quickly, thank you. I see those hands, well done. You can pop them down again, awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else you wanna say yes to recommitting your life to Jesus? I don't care if you do this every week, one day it's gonna stick and you're gonna be all in. Okay, we're gonna pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. I receive your forgiveness now. I invite your Holy Spirit to come and live in me. And I commit to living for you. Help me. <laughs> Amen. Woo! Well done, guys. That's awesome. Incredible. Okay, the second thing I've already said I want to do. See, I believe there are people today who maybe you've found yourselves in a situation or a place of wondering, where is God in my life? How did this happen to me? Maybe you're just feeling under it. It's been a lot. And you need somebody to stand with you in prayer for any reason. That about anything that I've spoken about in this message, I invite you now to come forward. The band are gonna play and sing and we're just gonna have this altar open. If you feel you just need to come and soak, do that. Otherwise, come and get prayer. And if you're not gonna come forward, encourage you, let's finish as we started with that posture of worship to our King who is worthy. Come on, band.
So we're going to uh, close the service there. Thanks for joining us online. And thanks for being in the room with us. We're going to continue to pray and minister to people here this morning. So the band's going to keep playing for a little bit. If you are not up the front being prayed for, then head out to the cafe. Have a great day and enjoy the week that's ahead. A short week as we lead into Easter. But have an outstanding Sunday. And we'll see you next Friday. Good Friday and Sunday, Easter Sunday. We'd love to see you here in the room or joining us online. God bless you.